Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us your servants grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory, O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Please be seated for the reading. Lady Wisdom accompanies God, and she calls out to all who will hear her to share her gifts of a good life and peace. Heed her call as she has seen it all. A reading from Proverbs. Does not wisdom call, and does not understanding raise her voice on the heights beside the way at the cross? Wrote, she takes her stand beside the gates in front of the town at the entrance of the portal she cries out to you O people i call and my cry is to all that live the lord created me at the beginning of his work the first of his acts of long ago ages ago i was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped. Before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soul, of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always rejoicing in his inhibited world and delighting in the human race. 
the word of the Lord. Now let's read the Psalms responsibly, beginning and ending with refrain. O Lord, our governor, how exalted is your name in all the world. O Lord, our governor, out of the mouths of infants and children, you have set up a stronghold against your adversaries. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, what is man that you should be mindful of him? You have made him but little lower than the angels. You give him mastery over the works of your hands. All sheep and oxen, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. O Lord, our governor. O Lord, our governor, how exalted is your name in all the world. There is no strife or shame with God. We are fully seen and fully forgiven through Jesus Christ. A reading from Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our suffering knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Lord Christ.
I speak to the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. It is Trinity Sunday. <laughs> and on this Trinity Sunday, I move to preach to you, there would be no need for hierarchy. There would be no need for hierarchy. Now, a lot of preachers don't like to preach on Trinity Sunday because a lot of preachers don't know how to talk about the Trinity. It's a really complicated thing. Most people would rather just skip it. So um, even more people that don't know how to talk about the Trinity don't know how to talk about it without espousing some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of theology that was deemed by the early church fathers as heretical. Uh, it's a really difficult topic. Um, in Judaism, there's an important declaration about the nature of God called the Shema. And the re this is the reason why the Trinity is so difficult because the Shema says, says and, the, and, uh, and people who are uh, Jewish people will sing the Shema at every worship service. And it goes like this, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, which means, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And that is the radical statement of monotheism in a world that reveres to make things equal to God. And in a world that Judaism was growing up in where there were many gods. It is said this Shema at every worship service, like we say the Lord's Prayer every time we have a worship service. It's been prayed like that every day now and it's been prayed like that since the time of jesus and even before the time of jesus by many many centuries jesus disciples and all of the church fathers knew this statement shema israel adonai Eloheinu, adonai echad every single christian for the especially for the first few centuries of christianity would have known this and of course if, even if they didn't know it through jewish worship they would have known it from deuteronomy chapter six which is where it comes from. And so we have a problem and the early church had a problem because here we have Jesus and this Holy Spirit thing that we celebrated last week. Wait, now if God is one, how can we say that there was this carpenter who lived for 33 years, who was hanged on a cross, who said that there was this other thing that was coming called the Holy Spirit. How can all three of those things be one? That's a problem for the church. So we want to know, and the early church fathers want to know, how can we affirm with sincerity and integrity the oneness of God, like the Shema, but also proclaim that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are also God? This is a very difficult problem. And as you might expect, there was a lot of debate in the early church. And especially since the early church before the time of Constantine was constantly being persecuted and they couldn't actually talk to one another, there were just kind of little pockets of Christianity all around the Mediterranean basin. The debate became really entrenched. By the time they were talking about this in 325, there had been 300 years of people saying, how do we figure out how Jesus and the Holy Spirit are like, are the same as God? And everybody had come up with their own kind of answers. And so when Constantine came in, the Emperor Constantine came in and made Christianity not only legal, but also the state religion of the Roman Empire. He said, you guys all believe way too many things about the Trinity. We need to figure this out. And so he called the council because that's what we do in the church. We call councils <laughs> when we have arguments to go over. And this council was called the Council of Nicaea, which is where we get the Nicene Creed. So there was a lot of debate and in the year 325, church leaders from the far reaches of Christianity all came together to debate what's the nature of God and what's the nature of the Trinity. Now, uh, you'll, you'll know uh, St. Nicholas, uh, the famous St. The famous Nicholas. Here's my Trinity right here. Uh, the famous St. Nicholas was so upset um, at, at one of the other factions that he got into a fist fight. <laughs> and so there's this meme you can see there's a, a at Christmas time, you'll see, um, uh, you'll see this meme and it's a, it's an icon of St. Nicholas 
and it says he sees you when you're sleeping he knows when you're awake he knows if you've denied the divinity of christ so if you're an arian duck <laughs> it was it was hot, so hotly debated that people got this fights in nicaea about what is the nature of the trinity now i want to say that when we come to the Nicene Creed, what was eventually adopted as the Nicene Creed, and then, and it was a, a altered a little bit more 50 years later, of course, because we can't leave anything alone. The Nicene Creed proclaims the oneness of God, but it also proclaims the fact that God is three people that share power and substance, but they do this without dispute and without hierarchy. And so I think there's something that we can learn from the Trinity in our lives. There's a lesson for us in the very nature of God about how we might dwell in systems of power in our time. You know, at any given time in our day, we are surrounded by and participating in systems of power. Some of these we choose to affiliate ourselves with. We're at church today. We're affiliating with a system of power. Some of them are chosen for us by virtue of being who we are and living where we do. I drove on the interstate today and I drove 60 miles per hour because that's what the speed limit told me to do. That is a system of power. It has power over me and it's a system. If I go anywhere in the city, I will see similar signs that tell me how fast I may drive. And if I don't, if I go over, then I will be pulled over. And if I go under, people will honk at me. <laughs> we are constantly surrounded by systems of power that we choose and systems of power that are chosen for us. The first lesson about dwelling within systems of power in our lives that, that we can learn from the Trinity is that systems actually exist. And there are plenty of people that would deny that systems exist. Whether uh, we're in a fraternity or a sorority, where, where the company we work for, whether it's the church we attend or the land in which we live and the governmental institutions and departments, we are constantly surrounded by these systems. And heck, we even try to go uh, out into nature to leave it all behind we find that we're still surrounded by systems. We're, some, we're surrounded by an ecosystem. We're in our bodily system, which tells us that we have to eat and drink water sometimes, even if nature is beautiful. And of course, we're surrounded by the universe, which is God's system. So even if you tried to leave all systems behind, you find <laughs> I'm still in the midst, middle of systems. We are at the mercy. We are at the mercy of systems. We can't escape them. They're built into the fabric of the universe and they exert power on us. And I think this is an important realization because people try to deny that systems exist. They try to deny that systems control us. It's why people, uh, people don't really like to believe in systemic racism or systemic injustice. They don't see that there's a vast network of human society that is built on systemic grounds. They wanna talk about individual people doing individual acts of racism or individual acts of violence. People who don't believe in systems of power want to talk about the bad apple. That's how it comes across. It's just an individual person that's bad. The rest of everything's okay. We don't have to control guns. It was just that one kid 500 times over over the past 25 years. It was just that one. It's not a systemic problem. It's bad individuals that we have to watch out for. Injustice is created by the bad apple. People don't realize that it's a system. They don't realize they're surrounded by systems. And the Trinity shows us that systems are part of the fabric of the universe. And so it teaches us to recognize these things in our lives, that there are things that have power over us. Another thing that the Trinity teaches us is that systems are not as simple as we think they are. Usually we think there's one head of a system and that everything flows through that one person. And if we change the top, everything else will change. And of course, we see this in Hollywood movies all the time. There's this supreme bad guy, he has hordes of minions around him. And if you just would take out the one bad guy, sometimes literally the rest of the evil disappears in the blink of an eye. All of a sudden, that one character, that one bad guy, and the rest of the evil army is just obliterated. But of course, we know that systems are more complex than this. We saw this with the rise of Trumpism. The system that Trump became the head of existed before him, and it's going to exist after he's gone. The January 6th insurrection shows us how true this is. 
He instigated it, but it probably would have happened anyway. That's how much, it, it wasn't just Trump. It was a whole system of people who were all spreading the same lie and all working people up. If you got rid of Trump on that day, there would still have been 50 other leaders who would have made it happen. Systems are complex and never underestimate the power of a system to adapt and change in order to survive. You know, at one time Trump went to a rally and he told people that, hey, maybe they should get vaccinated. And do you know what happened? They booed him. He's part, he's the head of the system, but he isn't the system. We should never pigeonhole evil into one person. Evil is persistent, evil spreads itself out, evil is complex. We've seen over the past 150 years how the system of slavery adapted into Jim Crow laws, and it wasn't done then. We have housing restrictions, segregation and redlining, the war on drugs, mass incarceration, the school to prison pipeline. And we thought that was all that was all gone uh, uh, decades ago. And yet we see even our in our own neighborhood today, gentrification happening. That's part of a system that goes back all the way to slavery. As my friend Jamie told me, when you have a giant pear tree in your yard and you pull it out of the ground, you think you got it all you find that for years to come, you're still finding roots in your yard. Just because you get rid of the main source doesn't mean the roots are gone. Systems are complex and just like the Trinity, there isn't one head. The difference is that the Trinity is a beneficent system. It doesn't have hierarchy. It doesn't argue over power. It doesn't try to subject or humiliate. It doesn't try to denigrate. It is a complex system, it's three persons, but it's one power, and they don't argue with one another. The third thing that we need to know about systems that the Trinity teaches us is that despite the complexity, they can operate in a healthy way, and they eschew hierarchy and focus on mission. You know, there's, there's this old anti-Catholic joke, and it says that the only thing that the Trinity ever argues about is where they're going to go on vacation. God said, I think we should go to Jerusalem. I love Jerusalem. It's my favorite city. I've always loved it from the beginning. But Jesus responds, I don't know. The last time I was in Jerusalem, they got a little angry with me. It didn't turn out very well. So the Holy Spirit jumps in and says, I know. Let's go to the beach. I love the beach. The ocean breezes, the sand between my spirit toes. I always feel so inspired at the beach. And Jesus says, the beach? That's a little cliche, isn't it? I get inspired when I go to the beach? That's so original, Holy Spirit. And so God and the Holy Spirit say, Jesus, if you're so particular, where do you want to go? And Jesus says, I've always wanted to go to Rome. It was a big deal when I was on earth, so I think we should go to Rome. And the Holy Spirit says, Rome, that's a great idea. I've never been there. <laughs> but in all seriousness, there's no hierarchy and no vying for power. There's no jealousy within the Trinity. It's a system in perfect harmony with itself because while it's complex, it's also unified. In his book, The Shack, William P. Young tells the story of a father who, is tra who tragically lost his young daughter. And inside this eponymous shack, the protagonist, Mac, meets the Trinity. God is an African-American woman from the South who loves to cook. Jesus is a carpenter from the Middle East. And the Holy Spirit is a woman of Asian descent. Now, just an aside, speaking of heresies at the beginning of my sermon, I have to let you know that this is actually a heresy called modalism. God is in different modes. It was rejected by the early church. It's this popular idea that well, God shows up in different ways, depending on what you need from God at any particular time. So God sometimes shows up as God the Father, sometimes as Jesus, and sometimes as the Holy Spirit, depending on what you need. That's called modalism. God shows up in different modes. In any case, aside from Trinitarian heresies, Young makes an important point about the way we view systems and hierarchy as his Trinity speaks to Mac and Shaq. They, they tell Mac, they say, creation has, taken, has been taken down a very different path than we desired. In your world, the value of the individual 
is constantly weighed against the survival of the system, whether that's political, economic, social, or religion, any system actually. First, one person, then a few. And finally, even many are easily sacrificed for the good and ongoing existence of that system. In one form or another, this lies behind every struggle for power, every prejudice, every war, and every abuse of relationship. The will to power and independence has become so ubiquitous that it is now considered normal. As the crowning glory of creation, you are made in our image, unencumbered by the structure and free simply to be in relationship with me and with one another. If you had truly learned to regard each other's concerns as significant as your own, there would be no need for hierarchy. And so the ultimate lesson that we get from the Trinity's systemic power is that there is no hierarchy. They are all one. We could compare this actually to the Roman gods. You know how the Trojan War was started? Strife, the goddess of strife, found a golden apple. She was mad because she wasn't invited to a wedding. And so she throws this golden apple into the midst of the wedding. And Athena and Hera and Aphrodite all find the apple at the same time. And it says, the apple says, for the fairest. For the fairest. And they start arguing about who's the fairest. And so Paris from, from Troy, he's one of the princes of Troy, is called to be the judge of the contest between the goddesses. And he chooses Aphrodite. And Athena and Hera get so mad that they, they get the Greeks and the Trojans to fight each other for 10 years. That's a different kind of trinity. That's a trinity where high hierarchy and power and the will to be the fairest among the gods is what happens. But that's not our trinity. Our trinity is one that's equal in power, equal in grace, equal in love, equal in affection for one another, equal in mercy for all of us. If we would just learn from the trinity about the benefits of sharing power, we would be a more just society. We are so ready to sacrifice people to the systems in our world. This line, the value of the individual is constantly weighed against the survival of the system is a condemnation of the ways that we let systems and institutions devalue human people. It's the same instinct that caused the death of Jesus. It's the same instinct that caused the death of Jesus. Wouldn't it be better, they said, to sacrifice one person for the good of the whole? Wouldn't it be better to sacrifice this one guy who's making trouble than to let the, the Romans come down and destroy all of Jerusalem and destroy our temple. And yet 70 years later, the temple was still destroyed by the Romans. The Trinity teaches us that there should be no need for hierarchy in just systems. If we held the concerns of parents for the safety of their children in our schools, rather than wrangling over our freedom to have whatever we want and do whatever we want with it, we would be safer and we would live in a more just world. If folks listen to the concerns of people who are pro-life and found out why they're so adamant about their stance, and then the people who are pro-life then listen to the people who are pro-choice about the importance of maternal health and wellness and the autonomy of the woman to choose what happens with her body, we would might live in a more just place. If we listen to each other and listen to each other's concerns, and instead of arguing over who is right, who is better, who should hold power, we might might live in a more just society. Maybe we could come up with a just solution that recognized the complexity of the issues that face human lives and other systems and these choices that these choices affect. None of the choices that we make are in a vacuum. None of them are simple. To be a human is to make complex choices. And sometimes those choices lead us into things that we might not want and definitely lead us into things that other people would condemn us for. When we make our choices so flat and so simplistic, we don't recognize the complexity of the human existence, then we denigrate one another. If we gave up our attempts at supremacy over our fellow humans, stopped worrying so much about our rightful place, we would fix a lot of problems in our systems. We would do away with envy and with strife. We could change our systems and help them to evolve from a zero-sum game of winners and losers, of who's who, of who's moving up, who's moving down, who has the most influence, who has the most power. The promise that Jesus gives us in the gospel when he tells us that there is more that he wants to lead us through with the spirit is that wisdom is standing at the gates and offering herself to us if we would listen. 
God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, Romans says. It's right here. It's with us. We have access to it. We can listen to it. It has many things to say to us. It is in perfect harmony with Christ. It does not compete with God for supremacy. They do not vie with one another for recognition or a golden apple. The third lesson is probably the most important lesson to learn from the Trinity. Glory and honor and power are one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. I'm happy to say that in our church, our leadership team and our members live out this sharing of power and concern for God and the congregation by moving above individual ambitions. And I think that we can all feel the result of the fact that our leadership teams, they work together for the good of the community and not for any kind of glory for ourselves or any kind of boasting that we could do. We just want what's best for each other. We want to come and feel the love with one another. This is the kind of system that needs to be replicated on a larger scale where people know each other, love each other, want, what, want what's best for one another. That's what the Trinity does. The Trinity is three in one, so knit together that you can't even tell the difference. Those who would be glorified, those who would be justified, those who would boast, let them boast in the Lord. Let them glorify the beauty of diversity and its unity and its love and its purpose. Let them be justified by their faith. It's the faith of the Nicene Creed that says that power can be shared where there is no concern for hierarchy. If we listen to wisdom, if we regard one another's needs and learn the lessons of the Trinity, then we will proclaim our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed without hesitation. And our conviction will make the world a better place. And we will go down the path that God has desired. And so I would ask you, as we celebrate this Trinity Sunday, let us affirm our faith with those ancient and holy words. I know this is going to be a little bit out of order, but would you say the words of the Nicene Creed with me? I'll wait for you to open your book. <laughs> we believe in one God. Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God, light and light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He is seated into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified and has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And to that, on this Trinity Sunday, we say amen.
The prayers of the people can be found in the Book of Common Prayer on page 388. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant almighty God that all who confess your name may be unified in your truth, live together in your love and reveal your glory in the world. Lord in your mercy. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord in your mercy. Yeah. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the services of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be, may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in their eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. We especially pray for uh, healing for Mary Jo Johnson, and we pray for the departed souls of Rosetta and George Hall. Haste no farther the coming of your kingdom, and grant that we, your servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold your son at his coming in glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. And let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways and glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. And the peace of the Lord be always with you.
Okay, good morning. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if you, you um, know this, but we have officially been back in the building for a year. So we came back, it was June 6th, I want to say last year was our first Sunday back. And uh, I, would like to, I would like to say thank you to our congregation for being as responsible as we have been during this whole COVID pandemic. And especially since we've been back in person, uh, we haven't had any, we haven't had uh, anybody get COVID at church. We've had a couple parishioners get COVID out in the community, but have been responsible. And um, so with their, with their quarantining, and, and so I'm really grateful to our community for protecting one another in the way that we have. Um, and, and, you know, COVID continues to uh, raise in the area. So please just continue to be cautious. Uh, we have our, uh, our big event that's coming up is our Juneteenth barbecue next Sunday. So uh, we need to, we need to um, make sure that we're all on the same page. So anybody who's part of that um, planning, uh, that planning group, could we meet at the back of the church after church is over? Um, and, and we'll just make sure that we have all of our details finalized, all of our uh, I's dotted, T's crossed, all, all that kind of stuff, so that we have this re a really great Juneteenth and Father's Day celebration next week. That's all that I have uh, for right now. Oh, I, um, so Tyrone, uh, Mary Jo Johnson, she, what, she was in Chicago. She was in Chicago visiting grandchild who was completing a soccer match and she fell down two steps okay and broke three ribs okay so so everybody say um say some uh, special prayers for mary joe this week and in the weeks to come it's going to be uh, ribs are going to be painful and pretty long recovery so so uh, let's let's keep them uh in our prayers i i did the the funeral for george hall on Thursday, and we had we had good representation from our community at the funeral, and um, it was it was a lovely service, and so um, the family was grateful. They send their welcome, and um, so our choir will, will miss will miss George, and our church will miss definitely miss Rosetta, and and all the things that they did, the ministries that they served here, and the people who they were. So we're grateful as a church that we get the opportunity to bless the part of people's lives at the end. So, Do we have any uh, birthdays or anniversaries that we can celebrate? I, Wharton, you come on up. We'll pray for your, your uh, procedure that you're going to have. Oh, I forgot to tell everybody. I did have a CAT scan, and I don't have, like, any kind of, like, massive brain tumor, so this is good. <laughs>
But we still ask that you would be there with work as you would teach us. We pray that it would just be the week that you teach. We pray that you would know the closer, closer feeling of your spirit with him and know that he would be always close with him. Oh God, our times are in the hands of the baby. We pray on your servant as she begins another year. Grant her grace and wisdom, grant her perseverance and endurance, and give her the hope of your ever everlasting kingdom. We pray that this next year would be a blessing to her and that she would continue the mission and ministry that you have set before her. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is always right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For with your co-eternal Son and Holy Spirit, you are one God, one Lord, in trinity of persons and in unity of being. And we celebrate the one and equal glory of you, O Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father now and forever. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. After communion, you guys need to go sit with the Lord. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. May the peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always.